Good morning, church. Good to see everybody here today. We're going to enter into worship right now. So just give it all up to the Lord. Let's let him know we're here. He already knows, but let's lift him up big this morning. Hear all your voices. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord.
Good morning, church. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let me welcome you back to the building. <laughs> Boy, uh, for those of you that made it there to camp and those of you that made it there to Sunday to worship and uh, enjoy some food, um, what a great experience. Um, just a thought of just having right now is about our potluck. We asked everybody to bring their leftovers, and boy, that was a feast, was it not? <laughs> I think next time we, we have one on the front end of that and see what, what everybody's been eating all week, because for leftovers, my goodness. Uh, church, um, I wanna talk about being simply healthy, because when I think about the church camp out, I think about what we've been saying all along, simply healthy. Simply healthy means having an, a personal, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ and <clears throat> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that relationship, and then an authentic relationship with one another. And at the camp out, I could say I saw that and experienced it myself. Do you not agree? Do you not agree? agree. Amen. Good, church. Um, a way to be authentic takes humility, I believe. Um, so I was thinking about this this morning, and I got into the verse of the day, and, I, and it was talking about humility, and I want to share this with you for encouragement. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So it also expands on what humility means. And if you bear with me, I want to read from the verse of the day this morning. Here's what humility looks like. When you think of humility, what comes to mind? In our world, humility is not something often celebrated. We would rather be seen as powerful, influential, and competent if humility is weakness, pride is strength. But is it really? Pride can feel good, but it can hold us back from who God made us to be. It makes us think that if we try hard enough, we can become good enough. If we're doing great, pride makes our confidence soar. But if we're going through a rough season, pride makes us sensitive to our failures. Pride links our worth to our accomplishments, and it prevents us from seeing who we truly are. Humility helps us realize that we are not enough, but God is enough for us. Humility will often ask us to risk something. It might mean laying down our social standing, our reputation, our financial security, our sense of authority, or our expertise. Surrendering our self-sufficiency, surrendering our pride, lets us embrace God's authority. And our God did miracles through Moses. And if you remember, <clears throat> think about what Moses did. Moses murdered somebody out of anger, but God still used him. He established David as king of Israel. Oh boy, can we talk about David? What did David do? Yes, he, but God still used him because he was humble and calls David a man after God's own heart. He worked through Isaiah in the midst of chaos, <clears throat> publicly honored Mary, abundantly provided for Peter, and glorified Jesus by raising him through the dead. When we surrender ourselves to God, we allow him to be glorified through us. Humility costs us something, but it leads us to abundant life. Um, <clears throat> So also part of being authentic and real, I believe, is sharing experiences. So I want to, let me find this here a second, but I just want to share with you something that I learned. I'm not going to go too much in detail, but <clears throat> during the church camp out, if you remember, I told some of you at vacations, I'm a little crazy. I like to get up early. Um, one morning I got up early. The other mornings I slept in. So thank you, Jesus. But one of the mornings I got up and I went for a little hike by myself. I went up to the woods, and I know some of the youth went for a hike up there. And there's an open spot by the road. There's like a gravel-type pit, and there's a bunch of rocks. 
And I went up there, there was a, a log kind of positioned perfectly where one could sit. And I sat and um, <clears throat> I had to let some things go. And I had to have a little humility and let down my pride. And I realized that um, trusting God means letting go of the things that I was holding tightly. Trusting God means holding loosely the parts of my life that I want to hold tightly. So church, I let some things go there. And it was good and it was refreshing. So I could be here all day and I can get into that deeper, but church, my whole point is watch out for pride. Let's be humble. Let's share together. Let's learn together. That's what I saw at the camp out and church, it makes me excited for our future. Amen? Amen. Church, we have uh, <clears throat> some announcements. Um, I want to remind you all, if uh, there's a weekend to remember coming up, and if you don't know, me and Teresa, our volunteer, work on the volunteer team for Family Life, and weekend to, the weekend to remember is coming up November 8th to the 11th. If you have questions, come see me. In the next few weeks, I want to be sharing with you some more about our experiences and, and how this has affected our life. Um, and you're going to be seeing some of these out and about, and I will be working on that, so coming soon. Um, youth group tonight from 6 to 7. And then, as you can see, the decorations have gone up, and this week is Child Evangelism Fellowship. We'll be hosting a vacation Bible school here, and the times are 9 a.m. to 11.30. Today we'll be decorating and having lunch. So see Lisa if you have any questions. Um, also, repeat session four will be Tuesday, August 20th from 6.30 to 8.30. And I'm going to invite Derek up to come give us an update on our barbecue. Please welcome Derek. Do you, do you need the mic? I don't, I don't think I need it. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so I got to tell you, in my, in my personal life, It happens. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. I don't know why. So Richard's been been prepping you guys for the barbecue for quite some time. Uh, Steve keeps giving announcements, and some of it is coming to fruition, right? It, 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 we're two weeks out. Two weeks from now, the service is going to look a lot different. Um, we're going to – we're actually – instead of talking about it, we're going to do it. We're going to serve the community. We're going we're gonna to serve the community. out at the camp out last week, the invitations. We had 200 of them. I don't know how many are out. Awesome. But uh, I'd like to see them all gone. I think we'd all like to see them all gone. And, uh, you know, hand them out, friends, neighbors, anybody. Um, uh, post them on bulletin boards somewhere. What we really want is, is the whole gamut of the community to show up here and uh, us, us serve them. Um, the the Barbecue's taking shape. What we're going to ask from, from the church, from you guys, is unlike a soup Sunday where we're asking you for your for, to make something and bring it, we're going to ask for your time, volunteerism here. Um, to pull this off, we're praying we get 200 people. We're praying that 200 strangers show up here. You know, that's a, that sounds daunting. I don't think so. Uh, it's, it's all about the preparation. Uh, I think um, I want to. Can you throw up that volunteer list uh, on the board? I've got a volunteer list. We're gonna hand out here, pass around, much like Soup Sunday. Uh, uh, you know, I want to just go over this. I want to spend a few minutes talking about it. So at the top, you see food prep. The, the the church is providing all the food. Church is providing everything. We're not asking anything from you guys, but time again. Um, Richard and Justin, they're going to be here the night before. They're going to cook 100 pounds of pulled pork. And, 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 uh, all night, man. All, on, on a huge smoker, on a huge smoker, they're going to be camped out back. They're going to park the camper out here, and they're going to start setting up, and they're going to smoke meat all night. So uh, I put them first on the list because uh, that's a daunting task. The rest of the food prep is you need volunteers to work in the kitchen the morning of, right? Service. Richard, it, 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 
I need, we're going to grill hamburgers and hot dogs as well. Not everybody likes pulled pork spider. Um, and uh, and uh, because we are inviting the community, we're going to have some veggie burgers and stuff. You know, we have to, we have to be a little bit more diverse. So we need a couple couple guys to run the grill, right? We'd like to split meat and turn, turn hot dogs. Um, set up, table and chairs. We're going to, I'll show you a visual in a second, but the, but the vision is to use this back area. So as soon as the service is over, uh, and Richard releases us, we'll go out there and, and we need some setup guys. Start packing chairs up. I think Richard discussed we got fold up chairs in the basement. Um, you know, we can get a lot of kids to start take, taking those up and, and the adults set the tables up. Parking and greeting. This was, this was big and, and we're going to get to it here in a minute. The reason is parking and greeting. You are, you are the first person these community members are going to meet. People park. People park. They're going to be parking in the field. They're going to be parking everywhere. I, we envision a couple guys, a couple people, I should say, persons, members, with orange vests on, right? Directing people, hey, hey, park here, park there, and go to this table. We're going to have a table out here. It's going to be called our connection table. We'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, the, on the map there. So you can just see we got kind of parking laid out in, in blue. It represents vehicles. But that, that person is the first person saying, hey, I'm glad you're here. Good morning. How's your day? Please, please go to the connection ticket table, is what it's also called there, the, in green. We're going to put up a, a red, we're going to put up a rope across the parking area so people can't get in there. And uh, sorry, Steve, he's getting. Oh, you're all right, over. man. Hey. <laughs> the, uh, Preach it. The, the, that, what's going to happen is what we envision, because this is more than serving the community, we would love to invite these people to our church. You know, we're talking about growth. So they're going to stop at that connection table after the, after the, the parker, the greeter said, head over there. And we've got our connection cards right here, our church connection cards. They're going to fill these out. They don't have to fill these out. We're not forcing anybody. This is truly a free community barbecue. Right? They're going to fill this out. They're going to drop it in a basket. We're going to have a couple people sitting there saying, hey, how you doing? Fill this out. We're also going to give them a ticket. It's a meal ticket, right? Uh, one thing we don't want to do is uh, run out of food. <laughs> that would look good at the community. So, so they're going to get a ticket. They're going to check into the connect table, so they're talking a ticket. And then that connect table say, hey, the line starts there. Have, you know, have fun. So the blue, the blue here, the, the, the blue up at the top is where Richard, I think, said you're going to set the smoker up. Yep. Down here is our table. It's close to the kitchen door because I can imagine we're going to be ferrying a lot of food out and, and refilling and whatnot. So um, activity area you see on that map, we're going to have some games for the community. We're going to have some, some, some cornhole, some a fishing game where kids, you know, use a fishing pole and get candy. Um, Richard and I are discussing a big bouncy house. I don't know how that discussion is going yet. I think we're going to go record it. We're, okay, we're going to have a big bouncy house for the kids out there. So, um, so you know, we don't want the community to show up just eat, not feel connected, not feel talked to. Um, they're going to show up, they're going to eat, they're gonna, their kids are going to play, somebody's going to say hi, how's it going, you know, uh, zero pressure, uh, but that, that, that's, that's what we're going to do, that's the goal. Go back to that sign up list, if you would. So, so you got your parking, your greeting, just a couple people out there saying hi, connect, go to the table. You got the connection ticket table, a couple people. You know, with the cards and some pens and handing out the tickets, uh, and then and then you got the hospitality crew. That that is everyone else, <laughs> right? That's uh, you can't read it there. It's restocking the tables, clean and wipe up tables. You know, if we truly have 200 people, we don't have the seating for 200 at once, if we have it for the duration. So you know, we all know people are messy. We're messy. They're going to get up and uh, use crumbs and stuff to wipe the table so the next person sit down and say hi. Hey, let me clean that table for you. You know, uh, uh, manage the trash. We're going to have a ton of trash cans out there. If it fills up and, and it's overflowing, manage trash, clean up after the barbecue. 
Hospitality also includes someone out, a couple people out there. It may be the, 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 older, the older kids, let's call them. Uh, managing the cornhole and the fishing game for the kids and the bouncy house. Um, I, I, I can imagine Richard and I haven't discussed it, but we're going to probably have an extension there. Because the last thing you want is overpacking it. Be there, right? So there's, there's, there's risk management, so we'll have somebody out there. Um, so I'm going to pass that around here in a minute. Um, I think you've all seen the invitations. You've all, the connection cards will be at the table with the vision. And we'll probably have more information next week. Um, and, and myself as well as Richard are open to any uh, questions, comments, recommendations. So if you have any now, uh, we can talk about it. But we really want everyone here involved. You know, you look at that volunteer list, I, I think there's, there's a good uh, 20, 27 lines there, people we need, and uh, that's over half the church, right? What do we got, 50, 60? So, so it's going to be a big effort. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Church, are we not excited? We got some good stuff happening. Um, so at this point, I want to... Uh, excuse the kids the children's church and invite the offertorians up and we will pray receive your offerings and we will continue to worship and glorify our god amen amen, amen. amen. <clears throat> heavenly father lord we come before you this morning lord oh, we are thankful lord um, we are thankful for everything that's happening in our church right now lord and um we are excited lord but we need you lord we need you to help us be humble help us uh work together, um, and uh, just love this community, Lord. This is what you have called us to do as Christians, Lord. So I just ask that you would work, a, work in us the next couple of weeks as we invite people um, and just, just share and get excited for, uh, for Ferndale Alliance, Lord, because we just want to glorify you. Lord, we ask you to accept our offerings this morning and let us uh, just glorify you and multiply for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore you all know this beautiful lady next to me <laughs> oh shoot you guys know I always cry this is my best friend um, um, Nina lives in Stanwood and she's up for the weekend and she is so brave she's like could I sing with you guys I'm like, yes yes you can and she's been with me through marriage through weddings through babies and I'm thankful that she's here because she is an inspiration to my faith. So thank you all for again dealing with my tears and welcoming my sister in Christ.
stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Amen, church? I love that song. <clears throat> Nina requested that song. <clears throat> and it was funny because we played that song last week. And Brian, he doesn't typically like to do back-to-back -back weeks on songs, right? But if you were at the camp out, you remember how powerful that song was. It was one of the most authentic, raw songs I think we've ever done. There was moments where... The congregation was singing when we weren't supposed to be singing, but they didn't care. And we we're just going to praise, and it was beautiful. And our hope was to piggyback off that a little bit, right, when we play it again. And I will say, I watched you all worship. I know it's a little creepy. You're your pastor <laughs> watching you worship. And uh, I can say it carried over well. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, FAC. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Especially when we're camping, God is. Good. Even when we're struggling, God is. Good. Even when we mess up notes on a keyboard, God is. Good. God is so, so good. Amen? Amen? I want to thank everyone that did come out to the church camp out. You've heard about it. If you weren't there, you're probably starting to think, man, I think I missed out. Well, you did, okay? It was an amazing camp out. Um, it was the vision of our camp out was that faith plus fellowship plus fun key key part there equals family and I can say for me and for those that I've talked to we accomplished that mission there was faith there was fellowship there was lots of fun including water balloons and we grew closer as a family I do want to give us a, a few special shout outs one to Maddie Geiswhite for organizing the awesome kids parade we, there was another church up there, and uh, we invited them in, and Maddie had bought all these little, you know, crepe paper and just different little decorations for the kids to, to stick on their bikes, and they made their bikes all special, and even my little toddler girls, they'd put pink things on them and stars, and it was so cool, and I didn't realize how many kids we had there until they were all lined up at the front of the parade, and they're just stacked on top of each other with all these bikes, and in my head, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, is this a liability? Is a kid going to get ran over? So I made sure to talk to a couple of those, you know, bigger boys. Hey, slow down. Don't run over kids. There were no incidents. I mean, at one point, I think uh, Sergi and Katie's son, Yuri, had made like 30 laps around the whole thing. Like, it, was a, it was a blast. So thank you, Maddie. I want to thank Brian and the entire worship team. It's not easy to bring a worship set up into the mountains where there's like one plug outlet that you have. And uh, they were able to pull it off in an amazing way. And as I mentioned, it was such a genuine uh, worship experience. I want to thank Doug. He went out and purchased all this equipment. And he made this relational cable. And uh, at the end of Sunday, a few of us got to play around on this. And it was this cool process of, I'm going to walk on this cable. 
and Casey's guys is going to walk on that cable and we're going to start pretty close together but as we walk down the cable we're going to get further and further apart and there was one moment where I just looking at Casey's like okay we have to commit because as soon as we take one more step if you let go my face is in the ground and uh, we happen to make it in our slides and everything so thank you so much Doug Donna and Gary aren't here they're at a string band jamboree um, Gary loves his old school slow folk uh, uh, soul folk music they're away but if you're at the church camp out you would have seen Donna reading a story to all the kids and I thought that was such a beautiful moment you had all these little toddlers even the big kids were there and Donna in her animated voice reading this awesome children's story uh, lastly, I do want to uh, thank Russ and Val. They made the coolest toddler hangout camp on planet Earth. I don't know how many times I walked by their camp, and they had this blanket and all these games, and there's all the little toddlers that sitting there having fun, and Russ and Val give them candy and chocolate milk and all those good things. So thank you, too. Uh, and, of course, everyone that was willing to let down their walls and engage in relationship, because that's what it was about. And... I saw so much joy and excitement through that entire camping, camping weekend, so I know people did. So overall, great success. Love you guys. Thanks for all that helped put that on. Um, I do want us to keep our focus on this family mentality. Um, this week is Vacation Bible School. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, kids that give their life to Christ in these moments are more likely to retain their faith into adulthood than if they give their life to Christ like beyond 14. Um, so salvation is really critical in a young kid's life. Um, Lisa has been putting a lot of work in here. Amanda has been helping too. There's been so many more candy as well. Um, so we got lots of decorations to continue to set up. If you're able to, participate. Stay, help, decorate. We'll get you some lunch. Um, if you're not able to, you can always pray. People are prayed into the kingdom. Amen, church. Amen. So let's pray for them. I also thank Derek. How about that? You can tell that guy's a project manager, huh? That was so professional. Um, Derek and I met for several hours the other day just making sure we had all the details on here. There's so much to do. So when he says that volunteers are the key to the success of this barbecue project, it's really true. So please sign up. This is going to be a big deal. Our goal is 200 people. If we get more than 200, we're sending people to the grocery store to buy more burgers and dogs. Okay? We want to make sure that everyone comes here, gets fed, and that they feel the love of Christ through our church, through the act of service. So thank you for, for heading that, Derek, and uh, all that you continue to do. Um, church, the month of August, we've really been focusing on what it means to be a, a family between the church camp out, between vacation Bible school, between going into uh, this big barbecue, it's all centered around family. <clears throat> and isn't God so good? Because we might have an agenda, and we might have a, a plan, but God has a bigger plan. Amen? Amen? And it's so funny because when I work out this sermon series, <laughs> your, your pastor's brain's a little broken, okay? It's a beautiful broken brain. But I don't, I don't see all the little details and things. And so I know all this is going on, and I know what passage I'm preaching on, but the connection doesn't click how closely related they are. And so this whole month we're talking about family, and it just so happens that today in our passage we are talking about family. Isn't God so good how he makes these connections? So last week, if you were at the camp out, you noticed that our, our message was centered around uh, that Jesus' mission was to spread the, the gospel, not to perform miracles. Jesus' mission wasn't miracles. It was proclaiming the good news. But he used miracles to aid with that. In fact, we even see uh, that resembled in the disciples. Because when Jesus called the disciples, he didn't say, now go do all these miracles. Jesus said, no, go spread the gospel. Go preach. Go teach. Go share. And I'll give you the authority to cast out demons and to do miracles. Again, to aid in the mission of the gospel. That was the whole theme. And unfortunately, in, in Jesus' time, many people actually came to Jesus not because of who he was or who he is, but because of what he did. And last week, we realized that often we see the same issue here in church, where people only come to church to get their needs met, and they never come to church to actually grow closer to the Savior. It's an unfortunate truth, but it is a reality we live in. And so what we did was uh, to show what the attitude of someone who truly wants to grow closer to Christ looks like. We read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 12 through 28. 
And in this passage, we saw that rather than going to the church and throwing all of our problems and all of our needs and all of our wants and desires at our leaders to have them fix them, we should go to those leaders with our problems so they can pray over us, they can shepherd us, and they can show us how to bring these problems to the one who can actually fix it, Jesus. I can't fix your problems. I got enough of my own, right? <laughs> but we as elders, we as leaders can help guide you into an intimate relationship with Christ so that he can be the solution for your problems. So that's where we ended. And it's from this place that we pick up in Mark chapter 3, and we're going to finish the chapter. It's 20 through 35. This is 15 verses, 15 very in intense verses, and we could probably turn this into a three-part series. So sorry if I go a little fast, um, but I really do think that this whole unit of Scripture just breathes into what family is. And so my question for us today as we dive into the Scripture is this. Church, are we a family? We'll find out. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for all that you're doing in this. This is a busy church right now, Father. And I don't want us to be busy because we have a mission. We want, we want to be busy for your work and your kingdom, Father. Because the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And we don't want to endorse that here. So, Father, I just want to pray that in our busyness that we are focused on glorifying you. We are focused on building a relationship with you. That, as Steve said, we are focused on being simply healthy by authentically pursuing a relationship with you and authentically pursuing a relationship with each other in all that we do. So, Father, I ask that you, you take this word, you let it speak to our hearts and our minds, that your Holy Spirit speaks through me, that you will remove any of Richard's ideas from this message so that it can penetrate the heart of your people. Again, God, we give you all the glory and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Sorry if I talk fast, but we have communion to do today, too, and I love that part. So if you have your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 3, verse 20. We're going to go through the entire chapter. It says this. It says, One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds, crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find the time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take Jesus away. He's out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of the religious law, who had arrived from Jerusalem, said, He's possessed by, and this is important, he didn't say a demon, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That is where he gets his power to cast out demons. But Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further, Jesus says. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who can tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth. All sin is blasphemy and can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying Jesus is possessed by an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, ooh, church, ready? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked around at all those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Amen, church? Big chunk of scripture. Some of the, the, the hottest topics in the Bible are in here. And so you can tell we have a lot of scripture to unpack, so let's not waste any time. 20 and 21, one time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again. Remember, Jesus had a popularity problem at this point. Everyone's gathering around him. It was soon that his disciples couldn't even find the time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away, saying he is out of his mind. So again, we have this huge mass of crowds pushing on Jesus, 
right? Even in the verses before, we, we, we saw that Jesus asked for a boat because the crowds are so big that he wanted to get on the water to preach from there so he didn't get crushed. And here he is, again, big crowd problem. They're pushing on him so much he can't even eat bread. He can't even find the time to eat. This is chaos, right? And in the midst of this chaos, some of his family that are lingering around, another translation says it's not his family, it says it's his own people, referring to either family or close friends, um, but more than likely not his mother and brothers because they're addressed later. So there's this group of people that know Jesus, and they would know him because they're from Galilee, right? And here's Jesus. Uh, this is where he's, he grew up in Galilee. He practiced his ministry there. So it makes sense that people know him. Right? There's a group of them before he got real popular and famous that knew him. And they're seeing all this go down. And they're saying he's out of his mind. Now, why would Jesus' friends and family say this? You ever thought about why? These are people that are close to Jesus, that knew him before he started his ministry. So why would they say this? Well, perhaps it's because he left a very probably lucrative business with his father to be a traveling preacher man. <laughs> Maybe he's a little crazy for that. Uh, maybe he's, a, he's out of his mind because he's doing this traveling, preaching thing, and all these religious leaders are plotting to kill him. And what's he doing? Is he, is he running away from it? <laughs> no, he's leaning into it, and he's pushing back against these. Maybe he could be seen as a little crazy. Maybe it was that he was showing spiritual power that these brothers and family members had never seen before. I mean, he didn't perform miracles up until he turned water into wine. And so maybe they're like, this is weird. This is crazy. There's something going on here. Or maybe it was that when he picked his disciples to be a traveling preacher, he didn't pick the cream of the crop. Like, this isn't the business plan you go into if you're going to be a minister of God's word. You don't pick those 12 whack jobs, right? The fishermen, the tax collectors. No, you would probably pick more refined people that were really educated in the Word, in the Old Testament, right? But no, he picked these other 12. So Jesus did give his family probably a, a few reasons to think he's out of his mind. But in this moment, when these people are, are these family members are chirping at him, Jesus doesn't respond. Instead, we hear from the scribes. They start to chirp up. So follow me in verse 22. It says this, But the teachers of the religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. Man, I love Jesus. This is so good. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered. <clears throat> I don't press on this too much in this sermon. We're going to press a little bit anyway. <laughs> A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. That tells you right there there's no place for feuding in the church. There's no place for feuding in your family. Feuding is my way or the highway. Feuding is it, it, it's going to be, I'm going to be a stick in the mud in some sense. Feuding is I don't like what they're doing. I don't like them. So I'm going to be in opposition of them. We don't do that here, church. Amen. Uh, similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Does that mean you can't have disagreements? No. It means you work to resolve them. If you have an issue with your brother, Matthew 18, right? If you have an issue with your brother and you're on your way to give your sacrifice, if you're coming to church to worship God and you remember, ah, i got to resolve this conflict, don't come to church and fix that conflict. That's what it tells us, right? Resolve it in the moment. Life's too short to be grumpy at each other. Amen, church? Okay, I wasn't going to do that, but I did it. Okay? And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man, plunder his goods? Only someone who is stronger. Someone who can tie him up and then plunder his house. So the teachers of the law, they came down from Jerusalem. What's really important to understand here is that this was probably an organized event. These teachers of the laws, these were like the top dogs. They were the ones that knew all the little details, the scribes in another translation. So what had happened is the Pharisees, remember they started to plot to kill Jesus? This is phase one. We want Jesus dead, but we got to go through the system. So we're going to call these people in. Okay, These top dogs, they're going to come through and they're going to analyze. So they're watching Jesus like a hawk to figure out what's going on. And right away they get there and they're trying to convince the crowd 
this man is possessed by Satan. Because if they can get the crowd convinced that Jesus is possessed by Satan, how much easier will it be for them to destroy Jesus? Which, again, is their mission. So they, they, they accuse Jesus of being possessed by Satan, not a demon. And the, the, the point that they're really trying to, 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 to show here is it's not an alliance with Satan. It's that Jesus is actually directly possessed, taken over by Satan. This is essentially Satan himself. That's what they're saying here. That's really intense. That's what they're trying to view. And they're kind of, in a way, involuntarily complimenting Jesus. Because what they're saying is the only way Jesus can perform such amazing miracles is either he's God, which they're not going to admit, or he's possessed by Satan. Because these, de these, these demons could never do miracles of this great. So they were kind of recognizing there is amazing things happening here. But they're saying the source of that power is from Satan. But Jesus responds so amazingly to the claims. How can Satan cast out Satan? Jesus was really showing if he was an agent of Satan, if he was working against him, then Satan's kingdom would be in civil war. It would fall apart. What kind of battle strategy would that be? I'm going to go take out my own soldiers so that my kingdom can win. No, it's lunacy, right? And he's able to just on the spot come up with this. He then also starts to assert his authority. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. What Jesus is saying is that, that I'm not even on the same level as Satan. I'm beyond. I'm the stronger man here. Let me show you how great I am. And he comes in and just bullies these demons out. But he goes further. He talks about you've got to bind them down. You've got to tie them up. That we're going to make it to where they can't even move anymore. When I come to cast a demon out, I bind that demon down. I don't just push him on the ground, take a few things, and leave. No, I take him completely up so he cannot move. And then I plunder. Isn't that interesting? Jesus plundering. Think about that. What is he saying? Jesus looked at every life that he delivered from Satan and demonic possession. He said, I am plundering the kingdom of Satan one life at a time. Amen, church? When he comes in, he's taking the whole life. He's plundering every little ounce of it. There's nothing in our life, church, that needs to stay under the command of Satan. When Jesus enters your life, all things are removed that are evil. Jesus comes in and he binds the things that once bound you. You don't have to sit there and hold on to it anymore. See, a lot of times the, the shackles, they, the locks are off of them. But then we get there and we grab the chains and we say, I can't go no more. How ridiculous is that? Jesus has set you free from everything. If only you would walk away. Jesus has that power. Amen, church. Amen. Jesus binds the ones who once bound you. And then Jesus, he drives this point home. This conflict of they're calling me Satan. I'm telling you, no, I'm more powerful than Satan. With one of the most intense statements in the Bible. 28 says this. I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. And he was telling them this, warning them of this, because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Church, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is serious indeed. Can we agree? Amen. And the person that is guilty of this sin is subject to eternal condemnation. In the other gospel of Luke, it describes this sin as the unforgivable sin. How many of you have heard that? What's the unforgivable sin? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. How many of you know what that actually means? <laughs> A few, right? It's one of those that people are like, I want to know more. And how many of you have ever felt guilty, like, have I committed that sin? Have I blasphemed against the Holy Spirit? Am I now subject? Did I commit the unforgivable sin? Don't worry. You have it. I will say that. If you're in church today, you have it. The reason he brought this up is because he was warning these scribes that they were at risk of committing this sin. Because they were saying that Jesus had an evil spirit. 
they were in danger of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because what they were doing was looking at perfectly good and wonderful works, miracles. And they were saying that those miracles, that truth, right, was evil. They were lying. They could not see the truth for what it is. It was showing that they had, they had settled in their heart to an extent, a complete rejection of the Holy Spirit. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. It's a complete rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is really warning us here is he's warning of, us, of, of the terrible danger that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And there really are need to avoid this. And we need to, to, but we also need to guard our hearts against the unwanted accusation of this. What I mean by that is if, you, if you're always wrestling if you've committed this sin, you just need to stop. Okay, Jesus is giving us a warning that this is serious, but he also tells us in, in sense that what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is is a complete rejection of it. And so to understand what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, first we need to understand what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is because blasphemy is complete rejection of the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. This is what the ministry is trying to do, and complete rejection of that is the blasphemy of it, okay? Does that make sense? So this is what it is. The Holy Spirit is really, well, this is what it says in John 16, 8 and John 15, 2. So regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when he has come, when the Holy Spirit comes, because Jesus ascends, the Holy Spirit comes down, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and he will testify of me that is what the holy spirit is doing okay convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and testifying of jesus so when we persistently reject this work of the holy spirit that he wants to do in our lives and we have that continued settled rejection. It's, it's, it's I'm, a sh I'm, I'm pretty much 100% sure, pretty much 100%, isn't that funny? I'm 100% sure that I want to reject this work. When we get to that place, that's the unforgivable sin. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, not because it's a sin that's too big for God to forgive, but because it's an attitude of the heart that cares nothing for God's forgiveness and it, has, um, it never has forgiveness because it never wants forgiveness God's way. You've probably seen people like this, and I don't want to name names because I'm, I'm not the eternal judge. God is the eternal judge. But there's people that will go and debate atheism. And they'll say, even if there was evidence and proof that God was real, I would never follow him. I would still reject him. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's acknowledging, you know what, God is real. It's acknowledging that Jesus is real. You actually can read, you can actually blaspheme against God and Jesus and can be forgiven. It's really interesting. But to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is the no. Because the way this works is God sent his son. His son died. So that you can receive the Holy Spirit which purifies and washes you clean. So if you acknowledge God's real, Jesus was God and he died, but I reject you, Holy Spirit, then you can never be saved in the first place. Therefore, it's unforgivable. It's that type of intensity and seriousness that is the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, which is why I say that none of you have committed that. Because you are in church. You are desiring to learn. You are desiring to grow. Have you said some bad things about God? Probably. And no one wants to raise their hand. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> That's not blasphemy. It's the complete rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. These words aren't intended to give you anxiety, but they stand to really give us a warning that we should not reject the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Does that make sense? So let's conclude by answering our question that you guys already said yes to. Church, are we a family? Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. 
they stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mothers and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my, is my brother and my sister and my mother. What's really interesting is you notice that Jesus' mother had come to see him. Probably to try to get him to abandon this crazy mission. I mean, I could imagine Mary, as Jesus' mother, would be really concerned and worried that everyone's out to kill him. I mean, it's, it's no secret at this point. This is a mother whose son is doing some pretty rambunctious things that she can't comprehend. And because of those actions, his life is getting threatened. But didn't Mary know that Jesus was to be the king? Did Mary forget Gabriel's important prophecies about Jesus when she joined her brothers and these friends in the belief that he had gone mad? So in order to, to answer this question, we do need to analyze what Mary learned from the angel Gabriel about Jesus. So Gabriel said this to Mary. He said, Jesus would be a reigning king on the throne of David. When she heard of this type of ministry that now Jesus had begun, she was probably confused because, again, she heard Jesus would be the reigning king. Jesus had chosen to work in the pits. He chose 12 disciples from a much more lowly walks of life than those in the powerful circles that could help Jesus ascend to kingship, right? And rather than amass power and glory, Jesus had chosen a simpler life, which was devoid of any worldly riches. So these choices that Jesus was making may have driven some in Jesus' family to believe that he couldn't take the path set out to him for God, from God the Father. So in Mary's head, Jesus, you're supposed to go be the king, amass the army, take over, push the Romans out. And everything you're doing is contrary to what I believe you should do. So it kind of makes sense that Mary was here in this place of, Jesus, you need to come back home. Let's hit a timeout. Let's reset, and then we can go out, and you can go be the king. But that wasn't Jesus' way. See, because Jesus knew the will of the Father. And at the very end of this chapter, he stated who his true family was. Anyone who does God's will is my brother, my sister, my mother. Mary was not in God's will in this moment. That's why he, in a sense, rejected her, left her outside. So church, in order for us to answer the question of whether we are family, we have to ask, are we doing God's will? Because who are Jesus' brothers and sisters and mothers and father? Or father. Those that do God's will. So if we are doing God's will and we are not rejecting the Holy Spirit, you see how this is connected. If we're not rejecting the Holy Spirit, then we are family. But if we are not following God's will and we are rejecting the Holy Spirit, then my caution is you need to ask, are you in the family of God? I'll conclude this message with what is my favorite chapter in the Bible. It's Romans 12, uh, verses 1 through 2, because I think this will help us understand how do we know what God's will is. If I'm supposed to do God's will, how do I know it? It says this, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, here's your action, to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. Church, your life is no longer yours. It belongs to God. Lay your body on the altar. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. You can't take the world's cookie cutter and try to mash yourself in there. It doesn't work that way. We have to let God transform us. 
Well, how do we do that? Well, first we surrender. We sacrifice to him. We put these worldly desires of wealth and prosperity and just selfishness away, right? Selfishness doesn't belong there. And then we engage in a relationship with Jesus through prayer, through reading of his word, so that he can transform our mind. And when our mind is transformed, we can follow the will of God. And when we follow the will of God, we are in the family of Christ. Amen, Amen church? Amen. Let me simplify it. We just need to be simply healthy. Amen. Glorify God in all we do. Build up the church through authentic relationship with Jesus and authentic relationship with each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for this church and their willingness to receive it, God. I do pray that we will continue to be a church family. Not a church friendship, although I want that as part of the family, but a true church family that goes through life together, that supports one another, that loves one another, that helps each other carry each other's burdens. Lord, let us be a church that is a family. Let us be a church that's willing to break down our walls, share our hard truths, and not receive judgment and condemnation, but instead let, let us seek understanding. Let us focus on how to love people through their pain. And let us be a true family. Again, I thank you for all that we're doing, and I pray that you will just continue to convict our hearts as we take communion today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have the elders come forward, and we'll do communion. Um, what we do in communion is we're, we're going to allow people to share, but we're a little short on time, so I'm going to ask you guys to keep it a little concise. Um, I know Deidre has a beautiful word for us, but if you, if you have even just a quick story of something that happened at the church camp out, if you were there, that really did make you feel like more of a family, I would love to hear that. I think the church would love to hear that, since that's our theme. So, uh, the mic's right here. Feel free to come up. We're going to start passing the elements now. Everyone's thinking if their story's appropriate to share in church. doesn't love a laugh in church? Huh? Uh, who doesn't love a cry in church too? I love it. I love it, church. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Steve, would you mind praying for the bread? Father God, we just give you thanks, Lord, as we remember um, what was done on the cross, Lord, um, as you broke your body for our sins, Lord, that we could have a relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, and we just ask you to bless this as we remember in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
I thought you were just doubly in trouble. <laughs> Would you mind praying for the hurt cut? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we just as we uh, drink this cup, we're reminded of the, the blood shed on the cross for our sins. Mm -hmm. Lord, and we just uh, we thank you so much for taking those upon yourself and uh, forgiving our sins. So the worship team is going to come up and they're going to sing a song that I hope you all will sing with extreme confidence because it fits so well with what we are um, preaching on. I'll fly away. This is confident that when the time ends, we're flying away. We're not worried about not a rejection of the Holy Spirit. We've accepted him in his fullness. Thank you, Pastor, okay. for the opportunity to speak. Um, I didn't quite know how I was going to bring my word until I got back there and I was cutting up the bread. And I noticed that wherever Dougie Fresh goes, he leaves his mark. I could tell those knives were sharp because I had, like I had a Ginsu. It just cut the bread. It was so sharp. And it came to my mind how sharp the word of God is and how we get in situations. And, you know, I was reading, uh, seeing something on YouTube, how we get in situations and we pray and we anoint and we lay hands on. But what did Jesus do when there was a situation where he was confronted by the enemy? He said, it is written. When we get into a dark situation, we need to quote the word of God. I thank everybody in this church for praying for me because y'all know that it was a heavy responsibility on me. And my pride told me I could do it. But then the word of God showed me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm fighting for Darren. I'm fighting for his life. I'm fighting for this innocent man to get out. This man is sitting there 38 years for a crime he did not commit. He's sitting there and the enemy is, if that wasn't enough on him, cancer struck his body. So he said he saw himself standing here. I see him standing here too. Every word that was spoken against him, it should be cast down in the name of Jesus. I was reading in Samson and it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. And Richard, I'm going to be quick. When Samson knew he had messed up, when he knew he had said the wrong thing and done the wrong thing with Delilah, when Samson got up there and he got in that building and he put his arms there, he said, God, I need you one more time to give me strength to avenge all of my enemies. And we all have one enemy, and that's Satan. So I am asking God, just like Samson did when he started pushing and them walls came down on everybody, I'm asking God to avenge this man's innocence one time. I'm asking God to avenge anything that you're going through, whatever walls are in your way, whatever the enemy has hit your body with, in the name of Jesus, our God will avenge you by the power of his word. There is power in the word and power in the name of Jesus. That is my word for you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all sing this together. Oh, 
thy way, O glory, have thy way. Cause when I die, hallelujah, by and by, have thy way. No more shackles on my feet. Amen. I'll fly away. Church, you are dismissed. If you can stay a little while and help with VBS decorations, that's great. If not, that's totally fine. But also, don't forget this barbecue. It's a big deal. This is our chance to serve the community. So if you can get signed up, that would be awesome. We love y'all. Have a great, blessed week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.